Let's dig deeper on this, uh, on Trump's pension for conspiracy theories and what it can tell us heading into Helsinki. I'm joined now by Tony Schwartz. He's the co-author of The Art of the Deal, Donald Trump's famous book from back in the 1980s. Tony, great to see you. Great to see you. Are you seeing President Trump applying the art of the deal uh, on this whirlwind trip through Europe? Well, I'm seeing him apply the Roy Cohn version of the art of the deal, which is uh, pound, demand, insist, and say the same thing over and over and over again on the assumption that at a certain point people will collapse and accept what you said, even if it's untrue. Is that what he does with these conspiracy theories that I'm talking about as well? Uh, where he'll dig deep into some outlandish theory, but say it so many times that he tries to trick people into believing it? I don't even think it's trick. I think it's uh, a very conscious approach that he takes to, uh, and we all know that he's repeated the words no collusion hundreds of times Hundreds of now, times, yeah. Because it's like a lullaby that he wants to get you to go to sleep to and wake up believing. and. He's very, very intentional about doing it. I noticed in Rosenstein's comments on Friday, he was talking about the danger of speculation. But I wonder if some of Trump's critics are falling too much into that trap. Uh, here's something you wrote on Twitter the other day. You said Trump is Putin's, uh, Russia's most prized asset. Quote, I suspect this goes back decades. It will, I believe, be Mueller's most explosive finding. Isn't that kind of speculation part of the problem? I don't understand. I, I don't. I don't think necessarily it's a a problem. I think um, we need to keep front and center that this is a person who is far outside the norms of ordinary behavior, and I think what we're watching actually, and we watched uh, this most recently when he was in Europe, is or continues to be in Europe, is the continuing meltdown, you know, in psychological terms, the decompensation that's occurring of a guy who has simultaneously been unleashed because he has pushed away all his uh, potential critics, even internally, and at the same time feels under siege. And the collective or the total amount of pressure that he feels, I think, in a very predictable way, has taken a guy and made him behave in ways that are more grandiose and more out of touch with reality. He lives now inside his own version of reality almost 100% of the time, and that reality has almost nothing to do with reality as the rest of us know it. But what you're saying is more extreme than the way he's usually characterized on TV. You're saying he's having a meltdown. We don't normally hear that in the conversations about Trump. Why do you feel it's within your realm to describe him that way? Because I spent an enormous amount of time with him uh, over a period of 18 months, because I am a 25-year student of psychology, because I've spent an enormous amount of time with psychiatrists who, over the last year who are trying to understand Trump, was one of the co-authors of the book, The Dangerous Case of Donald Trump, and because I believe the republic is at enormous risk that goes far beyond what most journalists are comfortable saying and what uh, the general public, therefore, it doesn't really fully understand. The danger we that face... That this is more of an emergency than we are willing to say. Absolutely. We are in a true emergency. And the rate, the accelerated rate at which his breakdown or decompensation is occurring is cause for us, and certainly cause for me, to come on TV more often, to tweet more often. It's not to try to I, sound the alarm. I am. I'm trying but to be Paul also, Revere. But you also, I remember last fall, you said, I think he's going to resign. I'd be surprised if Trump doesn't resign by the end of the year. That was 2017. Now we're in 2018. You're absolutely right. And I completely missed it. I, I think I got it wrong. I think I underestimated the the enormous attachment that he would that he would have to being in that office. Oh. Um, well, he sure seemed to like meeting the Queen the other day. I think he likes uh, meeting all of these people, and he particularly likes dominating these people. So I think what I hear you saying is journalists need to have more courage when talking about this man's fitness for office. Look, That's he, something that comes up from time to time, but is not a regular part of the conversation. He, he has blurred the line for all of us between uh, behaving in the ways that we ordinarily would and 
doing what we think is necessary in the face of an extraordinary danger. And I think journalists are in a challenging position as a consequence. And I don't, I'm, I'm relieved not to be a journalist right now. <laughs> That's so interesting, why? Because I do think that it's critical that anybody who feels and sees what's actually happening feel comfortable speaking out. The other day at one of the press avails, President Trump was asked about his tweeting habits, and he once again used that line about being a stable genius. Here's, here's how he said it. I'm very consistent. I'm a very stable genius. So is this one of those cases where he's projecting? What do you think that is when he says, I'm a very stable genius? Well, I think it's partly simply his grandiosity, uh, meaning the inflation of his own self-worth, uh, covering over a very deep insecurity that I think is at the core of this. Uh, and I also think it's, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a way of describing himself that is actually the opposite, as is often the case with stuff he says. Well, he of hears who people he like is. you saying he's unstable. So he says he's very stable. He hears people accusing him of collusion. So he says there's no collusion. That's uh, precisely what he does. And he also, another very uh, analogous tactic is, he describes other people in ways that fully characterize himself. That is projection. And he is endless in his uh, projections. Tony, thanks so much for being here. Thank you. Thanks.